We're in part five of our story of Moses building in our series, building a people of God with unusual characters. And as I have said several times during this series, that's really good news because each of us are rather unusual characters as well. And God also builds us into his people. Um, now, I'm going to be talking about wrestling with unruly Israel today because that's um, that becomes the definition of what's going on in the book of Exodus or the uh, chapters of Exodus. Um, and so, let's see, I actually discovered that I had a shortage in my printer. Page one is not there. Um, so let me reset myself. I got it on the screen and I just am missing my other parts of it. But we, we came to, um, we came to Exodus chapter 20, actually 19 as they came to the mountain. And there was in that place, a God who spoke to them in thunder. In fact, they'd been invited up to the mountain and, uh, and they had been invited to hear the voice of God. I spoke of this last week as we closed up. Uh, and it says in Exodus 19, 17, Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet God and they stood at the foot of the mountain. And they're standing at the foot of the mountain as the sound of the ram's horn grew louder and louder. Moses, Moses spoke and God answered him in the thunder. And so God said, this is so that the people will know that you are my prophet, that you hear my voice and share it. And then we had the word, God spoke these words. So that's at the very beginning of our first rendering of the Ten Commandments in Exodus chapter 20. You know, he says, I am the Lord your God. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make any graven idols. And all of those uh, Ten Commandments that we know, those were spoken in the presence of the people. And it was after that, we discovered that this was a people who just didn't want to hear directly from God. All of their lives, they had been surrounded by religion. They'd been surrounded by the gods of Egypt. They'd been surrounded by idols. They had been uh, received their religion on the serving trays that the priests brought them. And, you know, for many of us, that is the case. We are used to receiving our religion on the trays that someone brings us rather than seeking a true relationship with God. But when you seek that true relationship with God, you are hungry for God's word. But this was a people who didn't want to hear God's word because quite honestly, they couldn't stand it. Chapter 20, verse 18, all the people witnessed the thunder and the lightning, the sound of the ram's horn, and the mountain surrounded by smoke. And when the people saw it, they trembled and they stood at a distance. They didn't want to hear directly from God. And so they asked Moses then to become their priest. You talk to God, then you talk to us. Let God talk to you, then, we'll, then you talk to us. They did not want to hear the voice of God because they knew that they could not really stand up under it. They knew that confronted with God's holiness, their sinfulness was going to just blow them away and turn them to dust. We have in verse 19 of chapter 20, Moses, you speak for us. We'll listen, but don't let God speak to us or we'll die. Okay, so many of us, we would rather have somebody tell us about God, tell us about Jesus instead of try to get the word directly. You see, God is hungry for relationship. I mean, he's, he's not needy for us, but he wants us to have relationship with him. He's not needy of anything but he's a God of love and that love asks for response. Well, so what happened with this, the people remained standing as, at a distance as Moses approached the total darkness where God was. Well, 
So that's what Moses entered into when he went up on the mountain into the cloud, surrounded by the fire, smoking like a furnace. He went into the darkness where God was. Why? Because this wasn't about seeing God. This was about being in his presence and hearing from God. And so in all of that, over the next several chapters, Moses heard more laws from God. And so after these first 10 commandments, which the people were in hearing, but all they heard was the thunder and they said, make it stop, make it stop, make it stop. Moses, you tell us what we need to know. All they could hear was the thunder, but they said, Moses, you, you go ahead. You be, you be our prophet. And so as he went up the mountain, he heard more laws from God. And the first law that God repeated when Moses went back was this one. Do not make gods of silver to rival me. Do not make gods of gold for yourselves. Now, guess what is coming in today's story? There's a problem with the people and their understanding of what an idol is and what a god is. They just can't separate idolatry from gods. And so they run into a lot of trouble in all of this. Now, Moses had gone down and uh, even invited some elders up to the mountain by God said, bring, bring the elders. 72 went up the mountain and were there in a place where they got to see sort of the feet of God and this, this, uh, this uh, uh, floor of, of uh, gems. And just to give them that sense, the elders of Israel, 72 of them, six from each of the tribes, you could say, went then to uh, be before God. And um, they came back down saying, oh boy, now we've seen God, this is good. But it seemed like the people didn't quite get that message because Moses went back up um, at God's command. He went back up the mountain and God continued to give the laws. And over the next several chapters, um, he's spoken to uh, in laws about the tabernacle laws about the furnishing, laws about the sacrifices, laws about the priests, laws about the garments, laws about the ephod, laws about all of those things that were going into this worship, the uh, tent, this tabernacle that would be used by God to prove his presence and his voice stayed with the people. The Lord said to Moses, come up to me on the mountain and stay there so that I may give you the stone tablets with the law and the commandments I have written for their instructions. He told the elders then, wait for us here until we return to you. Aaron and her are here with you. Whoever has a dispute should go to them. And that's when Moses went up on the mountain of God. Now, when he was on the mountain, the people struggled somewhat about how to manage what was going on. But Moses was there in the presence of God. Everything else was blocked out. Everything else was locked out as God was speaking to Moses. And you notice that God said, I'm going to write all the laws on the tablet. He didn't say just 10. When you pick up old ancient, uh, when, when you the archaeologists pick up, ancient tablets of stone, ancient records of people have and the cuneiform writing is that's common in the clay. Uh, those, uh, those tablets often contain laws for the people and God had, was doing this for the people. He was writing it all down, not just the 10, but he was writing it all down for Moses. And, um, and so Moses went into his presence and the appearance of the Lord's glory to the Israelites at the foot of the mountain was like a consuming fire on the mountaintop. And so, you know, if you're, we have a lot of consuming fires in Southern California, and you can't hardly imagine that you would actually walk up the mountain into that fire. Well, they weren't used to consuming fires in Egypt. 
because it was, for one thing, it was mostly desert. For the other thing, they were in the Delta where there was more green than there was brown. And um, they weren't used to this kind of fire. When they saw this kind of fire on the hillside, they would have run from it. But Moses entered into it. But this was about the Lord's glory, not about the fire. Notice it says the appearance of the Lord's glory was like a consuming fire on the mountaintop, just trying to describe what the, what the overwhelming presence of God, how he developed that darkness that Moses entered into, what that was like. And so Moses entered in to God's presence. He entered in so that he might hear these words from God, that he might deliver them to the people. And in 24, 18, he entered the cloud. He went up the mountain. He remained on the mountain 40 days and 40 nights. And in all of that, as he, God was giving all of these commands for the tabernacle about size, about what to make it out of, and about the, the, uh, the uh, sea for washing the sacrifices and about the altar for the burnt sacrifices and about the lampstands and the uh, tables for the showbread and the size of the meeting place, all of these kinds of things. Um, he was up there for 40 days, 40 nights. And while he was up there, he also says, this is something that you should know from the Old Testament, that God in chapter 31 of Hebrews is giving spiritual gifts to his people for the purpose of fulfilling his plans. And he says that in, in chapter 31 of Exodus, God's gifts of his spirit and talents are given that this might be accomplished. The Lord also spoke to Moses, look, I've appointed by name Bezalel, son of Uri, son of Hur, the tribe of Judah. I have filled him with God's spirit, with wisdom, with understanding, and ability in every craft. See how God does that? Now, he still does that today. Sometimes we don't notice that as God's gifting, but that is God's gifting. If you're talented in those things that help to increase the value uh, of presence and worship, and it might be music, it might be the decorations, it might be all kinds of things. God is at work giving the talents for that to happen, to honor him by his spirit. In 31.6, I've also selected Oholiab, son of Ahizamak, of the tribe of Dan, to be with him. I have put wisdom in the heart of every skilled artisan in order to make all that I have commanded you. That's also saying, guess what, Moses, you don't have to do it yourself. And, you know, that's that's kind of good news. Now, he was leading a little larger congregation than me. You know, when you're solo pastor, it, it sometimes looks like you have to do it all yourself. But God always surrounds us with gifted people. And I'm so grateful for the gifts that surround me and are used all the time for God's glory. So grateful for that. And in all of that, of course, God commands the Sabbath. That's a very important part of the rules he gives to the Israelites because commanding the Sabbath is not about uh, finding a way to find fault with people. It's about giving God's people rest. As slaves, they were seven days a week. They were 365 days a year. There was no time off. And as God brought them out of slavery, he brought them to himself, and he had given the Sabbath command earlier, and he reinforces it here, and it actually has a death sentence if you disobey it in this part of, of Exodus. But uh, the purpose is that he is showing that he knows people need rest. Six days work. Seventh, no work. That's the essence of the Sabbath. Very simply, rest. Find rest in the cycle of your days. Find rest and some time to be with God. Find rest and reflect on all that God has done. Find rest and some of us are saying, I have no time for rest. Well, I understand that part too. But the scripture reminds us, find time for rest. God commands the Sabbath. He says it this way in, in chapter 31, verses 12 and 13. The Lord said to Moses, 
Tell the Israelites, you must observe my Sabbaths, for it is a sign between me and you throughout your generation, so that you will know that I am the Lord who consecrates you. And so this is not just a message for rest. This is also an identity with the holy God. And so he says this Sabbath idea is a sign of his own covenant with you. You are my covenant people. When I was younger, except for maybe one out of 10 gas stations, nothing was open on Sunday. You know, nothing was open on Sunday, maybe a hot dog stand here and there. But, you know, basically nothing was open. You couldn't go to the grocery store. You couldn't go to the hardware store. You couldn't go, to, there was no department store open on Sundays. Why? Because in those days, there was still a reflection of this command present in the people of this nation. Even though it was yet a reflection, it was not understood by everyone because they didn't receive it as part of God's instruction to set us apart from other people. But that is part of what God gives us as a Sabbath. He says, put a rhythm in your life, a rhythm of rest, a rhythm of worship that people will know that you are mine. It's a sign of his covenant. He says it this way. This is a sign forever between me and the Israelites. For in six days, the Lord made the heavens and the earth. And on the seventh day, he rested and was refreshed. Now, it wasn't that God got tired. It's that God set the pattern for us. And that's true always. He sets a pattern for we who are made in his image. And so... This goes on, of course, and Moses is receiving a lot of these instructions. It is now, you know, 40 days and 40 nights that he's up there. And we find out that God's commands that he receives on this mountain, written in stone, God said at first, I'm going to write this on, on the tablets for you. Well, why do you put, we use that phrase, written in stone. Why? It's like God's stamp on it. You know, we, that's, that's what we've taken into our idiom of saying that, you know, we, or, or we might say, well, you know, this isn't written in stone, but, you know, as, but God's law is written in stone. That is how they started. And it comes this way in Exodus 31, 18. When he finished with Moses on Mount Sinai, he gave him the two tablets of the testimony, stone tablets inscribed by the finger of God, God himself wrote it in stone. So is that any wonder that we might want to pay attention? However, during all this time, the Israelites become unruly. And in fact, they had become so unruly, it only took them three months to get from the borders of Egypt through the Red Sea, through the desert and finding water and receiving the manna and uh, fed the quail and all of that. It only take, it took them three months to the day, the scripture says, to arrive at Sinai, the mountain of God. And now Moses had gone up and down a couple of times. And now he went into the darkness, into the cloud, into the fire with God for 40 days and 40 nights. That's almost half the amount of time it took the whole troop to come from Egypt to the mountain. And they were antsy about this. They were antsy about that. And, and because of this, they became particularly prone to breaking one of God's most basic rules for setting them apart from other people. We'll get to that in a moment, but we're about to discover the depth of their disease of selfish sin. After arriving at Sinai, they didn't know what was going on with Moses leaving them. You know, one of the reasons this, this happens to us, I think, 
I think it could be said that one of the reasons we decide how to make up our own standards about what we think is right or about what we should believe about God or how, what we should practice about God is because we are an impatient creation living in 10 minute segments of stories instead of patiently waiting for God to give us the whole story. And so we get impatient, we make up our own rules, we decide how we need to do that. So we are kind of in the same boat as the Israelites, only we just do it a little differently. And we come to this incredible story of Israel's demand for idols while Moses is up on the mountain. In Exodus 32, it begins first with their antsy impatience. It's also mixed with their fear because they have more fear of man than they have of God, even this God who opened the sea, brought them through, whom they witnessed crash the sea down upon their, uh, their enemies and drowned the armies of Pharaoh. And yet they had trouble believing this one who brought the manna every day in the desert, this one who brought water from a rock, this one who was able to make um, poison water sweet, this one who was God among them. Well, it says in Exodus 32, 1, when the people saw that Moses delayed in coming down from the mountain, they gathered around Aaron and said to him, come, make gods for us who will go before us, because this Moses, the man who brought us up from the land of Egypt, we don't know what happened to him. It's been long enough. It's not a week. It's not two weeks, not three weeks, not four weeks. It's five weeks and then some. It's been long enough. We don't know what's happened to him. I bet he's not even coming down. Well, what I think is really incredible in this part of the story is how quickly Aaron caves in. We don't have the list of conversations. We just have that, that uh, uh, the people saw Moses was delayed. They gathered around Aaron, and I'm assuming this is the leaders because somebody with influence here, and said, you know, I don't think Moses is going to be any help at all. I might have expected him to have a better backbone. I might have expected him to stand up to the people because he'd been right there with Moses through all the conversations with the elders of Israel and with Pharaoh and seen firsthand the mighty miracles that God was working to force Pharaoh to let the people go. But he caves in to the pressure of the people, kind of proving that he was not supposed to be the leader of the people, just Moses stand in when he was gone. But Exodus 32, 2, it says, Aaron replied to them, take off the gold rings that are on the ears of your wives, your sons, your daughters, and bring them to me. Okay, bring me the gold. Let's see if you're serious. That's the first thing. Bring me all your gold. Are you serious? Is this really what you want? Okay, he, maybe, maybe he was trying to put a barrier there, you know, give a little time, give a little space, because if they weren't willing to do this, they didn't want to go further. But it turns out all the people took off the gold rings that were on their ears and brought them there. So he had this pile of gold rings. He had several hundred, maybe several thousand pieces of gold in front of him. And so in response to what the people demanded. Aaron crafts the golden calf. He took the gold and in direct defiance of the second commandment spoken in the people's hearing, Exodus 20 verse four, do not make an idol for yourself, whether in the shape of anything in the heavens above or the earth below or the waters under the earth, in direct defiance of that same law repeated to Moses when the people backed off from the mountain, do not make gods of silver to rival me, do not make gods of gold for yourself. Aaron, did exactly what God had commanded them not to do. And so it says that he took from them the gold. He fashioned it with an engraving tool. 
and made it into an image of a calf. Then they said, these are your gods who brought you up from the land of Egypt. Aaron and Hur followed the, the pressure of the people instead of the purposes of God. So Aaron made the calf from all the gold that was brought to him. And he was the craftsman, it says, who formed it into a calf with an engraving tool. And so as they brought this out, now, by the way, this was not a big gold calf. There isn't all that much gold, even if they have a lot of gold. This would have been, if it was solid, a golden calf. If it was hollow, well, a golden calf. But, you know, it wouldn't have been as imposing as anything that they had witnessed in Egypt. But it became something they could focus on. And the leaders of the people spoke this amazing blasphemy. Behold your gods who brought you up from the land of Egypt. So instead of standing up and defying, defending Yahweh God who had spoken to him with Moses there and got right into the spirit of what was happening. And it says that in, in verse five of chapter 32, he saw this, he built an altar in front of it and he made an announcement. There's gonna be a festival to the Lord tomorrow. He said, let's party. And so early the next morning, they arose, they offered burnt offerings and presented fellowship offerings. The people sat down to eat and drink and then they got up to party. In fact, this was such a raucous noise that, that Joshua, who was on the mountain with Moses, as Moses came out of the cloud, Joshua says, it sounds like there's a war going on down there. And Moses says, but I hear smoke. And so the question comes at this point, whose people are these? <laughs> whose people are these and it's because they have turned away from the law they've turned away from the presence of god they've turned away from the voice of god they've chosen that they will follow their own patterns to think about god and we hear this complaint that god makes against moses people the people of moses well, that's what, listen to this. It's incredible. In Exodus 32, 7, the Lord spoke to Moses, go down at once for your people you brought out of Egypt have acted corruptly. Okay. God disowned them out of hand, it seems like. Um, they have quickly turned from the way I commanded them. They have made for themselves an image of a calf. They have bowed down to it, sacrificed to it, and said, Israel, these are your gods who brought you up from the land of Egypt. God is absolutely incensed at this behavior. After all he had done for them, they still go their own ways. They follow the ways of the world instead of following the ways of God. In verse 32, 9, the Lord also said to Moses, I've seen these people. They are a stiff-necked, stubborn people. <laughs> Incredible. Moses, your people. God's blaming Moses, it looks like, for a moment here, doesn't it? Do you see what your people have done? Almost like living in a family where the children find out how to pit one parent against the other. And so pretty soon the parents are coming and said, do you know what your son did? Do you know what I saw your daughter doing? Well, this was going on. This is old, this is old news. This is scripture. This is way back in Exodus. And um, God is ready to destroy Israel because of this. And so here's what he says, 30 through 10. Moses, leave me alone so that my anger can burn against them and I can destroy them. I'll, I'll, don't worry. I'll make a great nation out of you. Well, it might be tempting right now for Moses to have that going on, but he's been through a lot. He's been through a lot with this people. He's been through a lot for this people. He knows that even though they are in a bad spot with God, these are still people, because he knows this from his own life. He 
knows that without the active presence of God in his own life, he could become a murderer. He could become a slanderer. He could run away. He could disobey the laws of God. He, could, he knew how to do all of that. And so Moses turns the people's predicament back to God. Yeah, this is the other side of the story. And hear what he says. But Moses sought the favor of the Lord, his God, Exodus 32, 11. Why does your anger burn against your people <laughs> that you brought out of the land of Egypt with great power and a strong hand? This wrestling is going on, even between Moses and God, about whose people are these anyway? They're acting more like yours, Moses. But Moses said, God, they're your people. You're the one that's at work forming them. And so Moses intercedes for Israel. And as Moses intercedes for Israel, he goes back to the beginning. He says, God, remember your servants, Abraham, Isaac, in Israel, because you swore to them by yourself and de declared, I will make your offspring as numerous as the stars of the sky. And I will give your offspring all this land that I have promised, and they will inherit it forever. Now, Moses was in that line. But he wanted God, he wanted to see God work for his whole people. And because of Moses' prayer to God, God relents of this, uh, this act that he was planning. And it says in Exodus 32, 14, the Lord relented concerning the disaster he had said he would bring on his people. Well, you know, this isn't the end of wrestling with these unruly people, because this goes on and on and on. You read straight through the Old Testament, it, it can drive you crazy, the ups and downs of the people of God with the God who wants to be in their life and in their story. Well, Moses went down the mountain, verses 15 and 16, then, and with the two tablets of the testimony in his hands. They were inscribed on both sides, inscribed front and back. The tablets were the work of God and the writing was God's hand, God's writing engraved on the tablets. He goes down with this gift more precious than you can possibly imagine that is given to the people of God from the mountain of God carried by the prophet of God, but then he sees what the people are doing about their relationship with God, and his rage shows up. His rage, he, he believes it's for God's sake, but as he approached the camp and saw the calf and the dancing, Moses became enraged. He threw the tablets out of his hand and smashed them at the base of the mountain, the stuff that God did and wrote down. Now, it's pretty good that God didn't send a lightning bolt right then. But God knew that Moses' heart was for the people. Moses' heart was for God. Well, the other part of the story that's incredible is when Moses confronts Aaron, his older brother, in verse 21, he says, then Moses asked Aaron, what did this people do to you that you have led them into such a grave sin? How did that, what, I don't see any broken bones, Aaron. What made, what, I, your fingers are all there. What did they do to you that made you commit this great sin? And Aaron gives such an amazing, foolish, answer it's just it's outrageous you'd think you were talking to a 12 year old they said to me may gods who will go before us because this moses the man who brought us out of the land of egypt we don't know what happened to him so i said to them whoever has gold take it off they gave it to me and when i threw it into the fire out came this calf are you kidding the scripture says it it's right there it's just insane but that is God trying to work and man trying to make his excuses. It's like, wait, 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 wait a minute. What did Aaron say? When I threw this into the fire, out came this calf as if the gold had its own life? <sighs> well, 
God's ready to leave Israel at that point. And I'll, I'll close up in just a second here. God's ready to leave Israel. He says in this Exodus 33, 5, tell the Israelites, you're stiff-necked people. If I went up with you for a single moment, I would just destroy you. Take off your jewelry. I'll decide what to do with you. You're going naked. You're not showing any wealth anymore. I'm taking it back. Moses already ground up the calf. They had to drink their gold. They would never see that again. And now the rest of their jewelry as well. Well, we have the record that Moses would go and meet God face to face. And when he did that, he pled for Israel because Moses says, I'm not going to go with you. If I go with you, I'm not going to be able to stop myself. I'm going to just zap those people out of existence. But Moses prays this. Now, if I have indeed found favor with you, please teach me your ways and I will know you so that I may find favor with you. Now, God, consider that this nation is your people. And through Moses pleading, we find out that God will continue with Israel. God replied, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. And Moses said, that's good. It says, if your present doesn't go, uh, don't make us go from here. How will, I, how will it be known that I and your people have found favor with you unless you go with us? I and your people will be distinguished by this from all the other people on the face of the earth. You see, Moses was getting the relationship part down right. And it's that relationship that marks God's people as his people, more so than the law, more so than the tablets, more so than the temple or the tabernacle or, or anything else is God's presence. And yet we're a lot like those Israelites when we face the challenges of the word of God, we are pretty much saying, God, don't talk to me. Have somebody else come bring me on a nice, pretty little platter and I'll take the bites that I want out of it. It's a cartoon I saw 30 years ago where um, a young man sitting at the desk, he has a Bible open and he has a pencil in his hand and, and his brother comes in and says, oh, are you underlining the important parts? And he says, oh, no, no, no. This is a new Bible. I'm just crossing out the parts that don't apply to me. That's sort of the way we like to hear the word of God. We would rather have somebody give us little bites instead of dive in. Instead of listen. Instead of hear. Instead of respond. Well, there's, I, I invite you to read these stories. It doesn't take that long reading from Exodus uh, 31 through 34, which is where I was uh, in my considerations for today. You can see those incredible push and shoves, that wrestling. Moses is wrestling with God about who this people are. The people are wrestling with Aaron about what they should do. There's all of this push and shove. Aaron, Aaron gives that incredibly stupid statement that, oh, I just threw the gold in and out came a calf when we already had the scripture that he formed it with an engraving tool. But, you know, he didn't want to take the responsibility. What did they do to you? Well, you know, we make all kinds of excuses to do what God told us not to do. The scripture is not that hard to get. But what we need in order to make it work is a sense of God's presence in our own life. When we know God is with us, God is in us, God is for us, then we will not go against him. That's what I want you to pray, that you would experience this week. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your wonderful grace and love and power. Thank you that you love us even when we're so unlovable. Thank you, Lord, that you challenge us even when we don't want to be challenged. Thank you that you love us enough to give us your laws. So we don't have to wonder, we don't have to make them up ourselves. But thank you, especially that the greatest law 
is that we love you with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And we prove that by loving our neighbors over ourselves. And we show that by loving one another as Christ has loved us. Lord, help us in that relationship. We want to honor you. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.